I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. Well, I hope that was helpful. And I want to underline that there are many kinds of meditation, many purposes of meditation. And foundational to it all is steadying the mind. Because if our mind is scattered all over the place, we can't do any kind of meditation. And also it's hard to function in life, right, in general. And so these fundamental trainings, which were highlighted and seen as foundational, like do these things first. These are like building blocks. Do them first. Um, in the Buddhist time, they're especially relevant. Steadiness practices, they're especially relevant in our, you know, go, 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 highly distractible, uh, bombarded with stimuli, trained to become stimulation hungry kind of modern cultures. And uh, it's also true, as numerous people among you uh, know, including my friend Jim French, uh, these uh, trainings in steadiness of mind, shamatha practices, samadhi practices, con preparation for jhana practices, um, these are really an important part of uh, the Noble Eightfold Path and traditionally have been seen as um, very skillful means to deepening our capacity for liberating insight and moving into non-ordinary experiences that both purify, kind of cleanse and clear out the mind uh, while being extremely enjoyable and helping us move increasingly in the direction of you know, casting loose from all familiar moorings and opening into the unconditioned, uh, whatever that may mysteriously be. So it's good. It's good to train in steadiness of mind. Many, there are many excellent teachers, uh, Shyla Catherine, Lee Brasington, uh, Michael Taft, Stephen Snyder, Tina Rasmussen, uh, Richard Shankman. I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving out some other people. Uh, wonderfully great teachers. Shinzen Young, uh, wonderful teacher there. Uh, you know, pursue those. Uh, they're, they're really worth investigating for you, training in your steadiness of mind. Okay. And I'll be coming back to this also increasingly. So for my talk, uh, I don't know, I'm feeling feisty, maybe as I get older. And uh, last week, uh, my talk was essentially about the first of several Buddhist myths that I want to explore with you. Uh, the first one being that life is suffering, based on a common mistranslation of the first uh, noble truth uh, pointed to by the Buddha. Uh, he did not invent these truths. He pointed to them. Uh, with a lot of clarity and with good intent, pragmatic intent, the first truth of dukkha. Dukkha being an inherent attribute, an inherently challenging attribute in life uh, that involves the fact of occasionally there are unpleasant experiences, the fact that always pleasant experiences end, sometimes to become another pleasant experience, sometimes to become neutral or even unpleasant, and the fact uh, the third attribute of dukkha, that all experiences have this inherently insubstantial quality in which they're made of many parts that are connected and changing, thus empty of absolute solidity such that we cannot claim them and hold on to them and keep them. So if we resist dukkha, including trying to hold on to our pleasant experiences, ouch, that creates suffering, which is an example of the real issue, which is the second noble truth, the truth of tanha, or commonly translated craving. It is craving that generates suffering, and the wonderful good news, um, among many other kinds of good news, uh, in the noble eight, in the eight, uh, the noble, <laughs> the four noble truths. There we go. Is that suffering is not inherent in life? Dukkha is an inherent aspect of life, along with other aspects of life. But dukkha does not become suffering until we add craving. Bingo. That's full of hope and possibility and sets us on the path, which has its difficulties uh, because we're biologically designed to crave in a lot of ways, of gradually disentangling ourselves from the 
machinery and habit force of craving through all kinds of skillful means. So that was the first myth that I wanted to speak to, the myth that life is suffering. And as soon as you presume that, and as soon as you go down the road that you see when people lay out, when they say, oh, the Buddha taught that life is suffering, first noble truth of suffering, blah, blah, takes you down the wrong alleyway right from the get-go. That's the first myth that I've routinely encountered in certainly Western Buddhism. Um, the second myth I'd like to explore with you tonight is this myth that you see in the culture, which is kind of expressed along the lines of, the Buddha said, just chill out. You know, just accept the way it is. Acceptance is everything. Just accept. Huh. Or just be non-dual. <laughs> just be one with everything. Just like be non-dual. Don't try to do anything. Don't separate yourself from in, you know, the present by having goals. Just don't do any of that. Wow. Is that really what the Buddha taught? And more importantly, frankly, is that really wise? I think not. And if you look carefully, not even that carefully, you see that the Eightfold Path is, is about development. It's about, in a traditional word, bhavana, whose meaning I'm going to unpack with you here. Uh, there's a beautiful metaphor that practice is like a cart with two wheels going down two tracks. One of the tracks certainly is an appreciation of our original nature, our true nature, underneath it all. And our true nature, as it is rested in true reality, ultimate reality, that's a very important part of practice. It's a very legitimate part of practice but it's not the only form of practice unless you can just drop into that early on and stay there continuously while visiting the in-laws or your adult children. Good luck with that. Meanwhile, we need the second track. We need the second wheel, which is about development of various kinds. The development that includes removing the obscurations, the barriers, the coverings, to our true nature. Development includes healing from our traumas, letting go of our addictions, uh, releasing our sorrows, you know, f developing greater perspective about things that are pretty intractable, sometimes a relationship with another person that we love dearly. You know? And in the process of development as well, we cultivate things like factors of awakening, such as mindfulness, uh, investigation, energy, effort, tranquility, um, concentration, you know, uh, equanimity, and other factors of awakening, uh, including bliss. There we go. That was the seventh one. And we develop these things over time. So it's very interesting that, um, and I want to share with you a piece that I came across recently from Andy Olensky. Andy's a fantastic Buddhist scholar, deep practitioner, someone I've learned a lot from myself. Uh, in Tricycle Magazine, the summer of 2022, he, as a scholar, explored the meaning of the word in Pali, Pali, and also its close cousin, I imagine, in Sanskrit, of bhavana. Bhavana. Well, the common term for meditation in... Um, Pali, the language of early Buddhism, and in the, and in the so-called canon of the collection of the Buddha's teachings in that language, um, the common term for meditation is bhavana, bhavana, B-H-A-V-A-N-A. -A -A. Um, bhavana has the meaning, as Andy points out, of causing to develop. So meditation is thus regarded, Andy writes, as a process of gradual cultivation, of slowly encouraging certain healthy mental and emotional states to arise and strengthen while, while, pardon me, while allowing other unhealthy states to diminish and pass away. Meditation is cultivation. Cultivating what's beneficial, 
what's wholesome, what's enjoyable, uh, cultivating a kind of homecoming, you know? So we use the, you know, one track on the wheel, the track of becoming, to come home to the track of being. Beautiful. Meditation. Now along the way, and I can speak as a become a holic, <laughs> as someone who's really focused on development, um, it's also really important to be aware of that other track, that other wheel, um, you know, that has to do with an opening into who we already are, in, including intuiting those deeper layers in ourselves that are wakeful that are inherently benevolent, inherently wish well, that are peaceful, already peaceful, this deeper layer in everyone, that are fundamentally wise, uh, fundamentally content, already are enough and have enough. It's important to keep that in mind as you are developing yourself. And in all that, it can be very useful to genuinely explore what Tara Brock talks about as radical acceptance, in which we face the truth of things and we accept it as the truth of things, even while sometimes trying to change it over time. So right here, how accepting are you of yourself? Because to cultivate effectively we need to accept ourselves as we are, or to cultivate most effectively. And self-acceptance, if you, like I did, grew up in a fault-finding home um, and can be quite critical of yourself, as, as I can be, um, self-acceptance can be, can be hard. Also, we live in a culture, a lot of us at least, in that tends to be very image-focused. And if we don't fit the pictures, of um, you know a sufficiently skinny or rich or X Y Z kind of person, you know we're not okay. You know we can get caught up in the wheel of trying to impress others without accepting who we are already. And you might consider if this is at all an issue for you. And I think it is for certainly the great majority of people, probably even the majority of people in this gathering tonight. One thing to explore is to name particular aspects of yourself, including parts of your body or different qualities that you have, and look at them and find a way into saying this as it is true. I accept X. I accept that I sometimes drink too much. I accept that I lose my temper. I accept that I yell at the television when certain people come on the news. I accept that I wish that everybody loved me, right? Whatever, just in your own mind, maybe out loud to a mirror, or just imagine that you're saying this to a friend or a spirit being or someone, to your dog, to your cat, and really see what it's like to take a position that you actually accept certain parts of yourself that are challenging. Yeah. It's, these are true parts. They are what they are. And often there can be a big emotional charge that comes around this where you just, you know, there's a kind of flow through you, sometimes of grieving or mourning or shame, feelings inadequacy, you know, anger kind of bleh, flows through you, on the heels of which comes peace. Waves of peace can come through. Whew. It's kind of like letting down your guard, letting down your hair, kind of plopping right in the middle of who you are and kind of giving up about who you are. <sighs> Doesn't mean that we... Uh, cease regulating ourselves appropriately, you know, to conduct ourselves ethically and compassionately uh, with enlightened self-interest uh, with others. But we just kind of plop in, hello, 1969, 
in the service of cultivating on our path of awakening. All right? And you can even find a kind of tenderness uh, in the communication to the parts of yourself or aspects of yourself that, in other words, the tenderness in you is communicating with parts of you that have you have felt, you know, like you don't feel that good about them, or they're they're inadequate, or they're not as good as they ought to be, uh, and and there's a kind of you can find your way into a kind of sweetness or tenderness in how you're talking, in how you're talking to yourself, and that sweetness and kindness that you find uh, in yourself toward those parts that have been unacceptable, warded off, disowned, you know, hard to admit, embarrassing. That kindness for yourself, kind of a friendly, guiding, encouraging, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, I am this way. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I did those, I, or I did those things. Now, you may along the way feel some remorse, or you may feel along the way like you know you're, you're a work in progress, but it's in the context of this kind of accepting of yourself, kindness, tenderness, compassion, yeah. Really, really, really important, you know. Um, and honestly, for a lot of people, probably, you know, certainly me included, uh, I don't really need to get much better at getting better. <laughs> I, don't, I don't say that as a brag. I feel like I say that as a confession. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like that's not where my issues are. Uh, you know, determined, diligent, you know, perseverance furthers. They got my face right next to those pictures, right next to those passages, whatever. Um, but around self-acceptance, easing, you know, that that definitely could be for a lot of people, including me, an area of major opportunity. Um, and it's interesting that along the way, I think as uh, somebody just noted to me a moment ago, um, kind of privately, is that as we accept ourselves, we can be more accepting of others. And so self-acceptance can be something that's cultivated, a kind of radical, um, acceptance and perspective and kindness about how one is alongside an effective encouragement toward who you want to become. So in, <clears throat> in the context of trying to bust the myth that Buddhist practice is all about just, you know, just being and, you know, not developing in any way because, oh my gosh, that might be goal-directed. Well, so what, you know? My goal is to, you know, reduce carbon emissions in ways that I can, certainly in my personal life. My goal is to take, you know, to help my friends. It's okay to have goals. You can have a goal to steady your mind more. It's okay to have goals. So busting that myth. In that context then, we've named my first, the first point I wanna cover with you, which is the importance of self-acceptance as a frame in which effective cultivation can occur, okay? Second, ask yourself, what are you cultivating, right? Um, I've, as a therapist, working with people a lot and someone who's taught courses for therapists, I find that often people are at sea when you just ask them a simple question. So what are you trying to grow inside yourself these days? or a different version of that question, oh, what would help if it were more present in your mind these days, in your being, in your emotions? What would help? What would help with your uh, estranged, um, what would help with your challenging son-in-law? You know, son uh, what would help with uh, your anxieties about this or that, uh, including you know, connections with others or public speaking? What would help? Right? What are you trying to grow? And the Buddha offers, he nominates a lot of good things. Uh, you know, they they tend to be found in the in the various lists. Uh, the eightfold path is a list of eight things to grow. Right view, or sometimes translated wise view. Uh, you know, right intention, right speech, right livelihood, right action, uh, right mindfulness, right effort, right concentration. These are things we can develop. Uh, factors of awakening uh, that I mentioned earlier, right? Mindfulness, investigation, energy, uh, tranquility, 
bliss, concentration, including non-ordinary states of consciousness and equanimity, or the Brahma Viharas, the cultivation of compassion, empathy, pardon me, compassion, loving kindness, um, uh, sympathetic joy, altruistic joy for others, and equanimity again. These are things we can develop. Uh, more pragmatically, uh, what are you, you know, what are you working on in some of your key relationships that may be your friction points? Do you know what you're developing these days? That's really helpful. Maybe you might want a list. You could do it privately to me, or you can do it publicly so everybody can see it. What are you, what are you developing these days? What are you working on? Um, and here's an interesting point. I just did a podcast with Forrest about authenticity, which is a really interesting topic because it actually becomes really complicated <laughs> when you look under the surface in good ways. And there's a lot to kind of sort out and learn about and learn from. So Forrest was asking me about, well, how do we integrate um, aspiration with authenticity? Because if you're trying to help yourself become someone who you're not fully already, is that authentic? Right? And so for me, uh, first, there can be a range in which we're authentic, and we can go to the high end or low end of that range. The high end is still authentic, and the high end of that range is probably better than the low end of the range. But further, I, I gave him a little example of um, uh, for myself that mm, roughly 10-ish years ago, I started focusing more and more on uh, lovingness as a path of practice and a, and a value and a, and a, and a healing balm. Uh, for the you know, some of the wounds in my own heart. Paradoxically, wounds related to how others have treated me were, have been in, in large part actually healed inside me by finding more lovingness in general, including sometimes for those people that wronged me. And so I was talking about that. And I was saying what was really interesting for us is that in this somewhat deliberate practice of the cultivation of qualities of the heart, I'm not alone in that. There are many, many people, including you all, cultivating the heart. Uh, I started to realize that actually, uh, contra my normal view of myself as a withdrawn and highly nerdy, heady, cerebral kid, that actually deep down my nature as a child and whoever I came in as, let's say, is a really kind of caring, loving person. And just factually. And I think a lot of people kind of discover that themselves. In other words, as we cultivate qualities in ourselves, often that does involve, like I said earlier, the uncovering of the ways in which they were already uh, present within us, but we just weren't aware of them. Well, that uncovering is a kind of cultivation. Right? So I invite you to, to know what you're cultivating, and to name it to yourself. Maybe name it to some other people and kind of know what it is. What is it? And you might want to put it into the chat. Um, I'm really happy to um, uh, quite soon segue into talking with you, some of you individually, around what is it that you're cultivating these days for different purposes. Okay? Cultivation. Know what you're cultivating. And then the how of cultivation, right? Um, I'm going to quote again from Andy Olinsky's piece in uh, the summer of 2022. Um, the method of cultivation is to repeat experiences often of whatever you're cultivating. I, as a positive neuroplasticity guy, whoa, way to go, Andy, way to go, the Buddha. <laughs> You know, repeatedly experiencing and, which Andy does not point to, it's kind of implicit, but he doesn't make it explicit. So I want to make it explicit. Not just experiencing what we're cultivating, what we're growing inside, but internalizing it through taking in the good. As you may be familiar with my material about that, there are many ways that we can use mental activity to engage neurological factors of lasting change in neural structure and function 
that is the necessary basis for any lasting change in the mind. And by mind, I mean much more than intellect. I mean our heart, our sensations, our desires, our innards. So we must, as Annie points out, and the Buddha repeats, we must um, repeat it often. There's a term for this, actually, practiced frequently. We must practice frequently experiences of what we want to grow. And additionally, and I say as someone who's observed people practicing frequently certain things that never seem to sink in, how do we help it sink in? There's some evidence-based methods. You can read more about this in my paper, Learning to Learn from Positive Experiences with my colleagues that I wrote. Um, one major way is to stay with the experience, marinate in it, have it be really rich, become absorbed in it like we were absorbed in our meditation. You can use other objects of meditation that you want to um, cultivate uh, in yourself like meditating and marinating in lovingness, the heart or meditating in and marinating in a growing sense of tranquility that starts to even open into a very vast equanimity and undisturbableness in the core of your being as equanimity underneath it all. It's the marinating in, it's the ex extending the duration of the experience it's intensifying the experience. It's feeling it in your body. It's finding what's enjoyable about it, what feels luscious and good about it. All these are now, in science, understood to be factors of lasting change in your brain, which is, as I said, the basis for lasting change in, in your being, right? So third point, after know what you're trying to grow these days is to have repeated experiences of that which you take in, which you let to sink in, you open to, you surrender to, you, you let them become part of you. All right? Okay? Bhavana, cultivation. And then, and now I'm about to move into talking with people. So Armen, Ar Ar you're first. I'll be there in a second. Uh, last. <clears throat> Bring it into the world. We don't just practice for ourselves. We practice for others too. So, and it's fairly easy to be all wise and happy and, you know, full of inner peace when nobody's bugging you. But what do you do when they're bugging you? <laughs> what do you do when you want something from them and you're not getting it, right? Or just what do you do when you're in a business meeting? You're just dealing, you're in life, right? Can we bring what we've cultivated into relationships, into our communities, into our societies, right? If we have compassion for suffering, does that not necessarily move us into taking action to relieve the causes of that suffering, including the upstream causes that are producing so much of the sorrow and difficulty that we're dealing with day to day downstream, right? Um, yeah, bringing what we cultivate into our relationships and into our lives altogether. So, and that, and that itself is a cultivation. The cultivation of living our practice uh, in relationship with others. Uh, and I'll finish by uh, just telling a story that some of you may know. Uh, a woman uh, who came from a traditional religious family in the American South, as I understand it, went to a meditation retreat, three-month meditation retreat at a Buddhist center in New England. And as she was leaving, she was quite concerned about what it would be like to go back to her fundamentalist uh, Christian um, family and in, in the South, and imagine the cultural trappings around that. And uh, people said, well, you know, da 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 and let us know how it turns out. So apparently she then wrote a letter sometime later, and the, the key line in it uh, that Jack Cornfield, with her permission, has quoted, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase it here, the key line in it is, um, my family does not like it when I'm Buddhist. They love it when I'm a Buddha. 
In other words, as we bring our practice out into the world, uh, it's important to uh, you know, do it from the inside out and be rested in the qualities that we've cultivated and trust, trust in uh, the sincerity of our practice and trust in the, the realness of what we've cultivated in ourselves and let it be the current, the river that lives us out into the world. Okay, so Carmen, and as I said earlier, you may have heard, uh, please have a question that's succinct and of general interest and uh, go for it. So hi there. Hello, uh, so it's a little bit convoluted. Let's see if I can make it a good question. As okay. you can tell from my accent, I wasn't born here. I yeah. came here 40 some years ago. And as I was thinking about accepting myself, accepting as what? And I think one of the interesting things, I don't know if you know that they call it Kissinger syndrome. As an immigrant, mm -hmm. you try to prove yourself ah. in this country. So how does one go about, at what point do you think, okay, what does it mean to be American? How, how do I go about, I never thought about that. As soon as you, you mentioned accepting and I was struggling with, okay, what am I accepting myself as? Yeah. Business wise, I've been successful, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but back of my mind, I always make a joke about it, being a foreigner. Yeah. But how does one accept herself or himself as a as that country or as a culture anyway oh yeah well i'm so glad you brought it up and um there's so many layers to it right uh one way and first of all it's tough to accept ourselves when others are not accepting us and probably right. the beginning was that in the beginning it was that like, yeah, that's right. So one thing that's helpful uh, is to uh, kind of deepen our self-awareness of and sort of unpack our own history. You know, what's, what's the background of our lack of self-acceptance or even worse, our self-condemnation, our embarrassment, our um, dismissal even of parts of ourselves like, well, I don't hate it, but go away, you know? What's the history of that? And that that's helpful to realize, first point. Second, uh, it's to acknowledge just the actual conditions that we're in, in in a country or a relationship or a family. If we're with people who are always finding fault with us, they're making us wrong in, in subtle ways. For me, one of the clues that I'm around someone with a narcissistic um, streak is that I suddenly feel I've got to keep proving myself. You know, it's like making an offering endlessly to some angry God to kind of get him off your back today. You know, prove yourself, right? It has those feelings to it. So being aware of those external forces that reduce our underlying self-acceptance, that, that's also helpful. And then you, know, you do what you can. You, you try to understand them. You try to minimize the toxic interaction as best you can. You try to find allies. Um, you uh, develop ways of just letting it roll off your back, reminding yourself it's not about you. They're messed up. You're not messed up. Things like that, right? That's helpful. And then I'll just maybe finish with two quick points here to move on to the path. I like that name. Uh, uh, the way I would say it, Armin, and I hope I'm not, I'm, you know, I don't mean to be disrespectful at all, just is that each of us is a, like a big mosaic. So who are you? What are you accepting? You're accepting the parts of you that grew up, they were born in another culture, the, the parts of you in which there's a lineage running through you of your ancestors from a very different culture, accepting those parts, you know, accepting the parts that prefer aspects of American culture to that other culture, accepting the parts of you that prefer that other, your original culture, right? 
uh, just all of it, uh, accepting the rage at the unfairness and and also, uh, you know, like the masks you had to put on and, and the people who misunderstood you or who were discriminating and biased against you, right? But these are all these parts. And that might be helpful as you kind of sort out and your path of wholeness and integration, which is, as people have said about Richard Schwartz's material, no bad parts. Who you are is the whole of you. All right. You know? And sometimes that involves claiming parts, not just accepting them, but really validating them. You know, claiming them as like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Heck with it. <laughs> That's a pretty cool part of me. Or, yeah, like, what's their problem? I'm not going out poisoning babies. You know, I'm not building weapons. I'm not stealing. Like, they they got a problem with me. That's about them, not me. You know, like, there's sometimes a kind of a claiming. Okay. And, um, yeah. Okay. So there are many examples of that. And then I'll just kind of finish. Underneath it all, often I think we can find what's deeper than personality what's deeper than our gender socialization. Like the, the Armin, if that's how to pronounce your name, sorry about that, oh, Armin. Uh, yeah, who um, is deeper than the one who has your name. Yeah, you know, and, and has kind of universal qualities. You can recognize it in others deep down, you know, a kind of, or yeah, just that, that, that those aspects of you that are actually core to you. You know, underneath, yeah, like <clears throat> where you're just kind of owning who you naturally are. Like without, I mean, I don't know you super well at all, right? But it, I think I and other people can go immediately, whoa, there's like a core of strength in this guy that's native to you, right? It was probably present when you were a little kid and has gotten more expressed and stronger over time. Like, all right, that's you, part of you, you know? Um, Thanks. Yeah, like an, also an exploratory quality in you, right? You kind of landed here, you know, in America, like what? And yeah, and that I could see in you, feeling you like an exploratory quality, curiosity, you know, like I said earlier about Mr. Rogers, but okay, that's you. That's underneath all that socialization crud uh, and resistance to socialization crud. Crud on top of crud. You know, what's underneath it all? And then being more and more in one's natural kind of deep down self. Yeah. That okay? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. So you're going to get muted and then I'm going to bounce to the path. All right. I'm really curious. Who is this person? And with the Zoom name, The Path. So you are. Hi, Rick. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Monica, and I'm in Miami Beach. And I've been reading a lot, Buddha yeah. and, and Tao and studying. And really, like, thank you so much. You are a light in my life. Every oh, good. Day. Absolutely. Um, no, my question is about the the issue that or the how to become to make it plasticity like neurologically could you repeat that idea sure it's it's a great question it's it's basically the how it's the fundamental how of um becoming uh who we want to be in a real sense you know it's, it's the fundamental how of growing the good inside that i'd be taught in every school right? And especially because it's a simple how. It's got two steps. People routinely leave out the second step. Step one, we must first experience what we want to grow. We have to get those neurons firing, right? We need to experience it. We can't just put a, a cable in the back of our head and suddenly learn how to fly a helicopter, you know, or be a loving person. We have daily and on a routine basis. Uh-huh. Yep. And then second, the internalization phase. I mean, I've written a ton about it, freely offered on my website. I summarize these eight evidence-based factors in the HEAL framework. HEAL stands for have, enrich, absorb, and link. 
um, check it out. Uh, also check out my paper. Um, I'm, I'm going to track your interest here. Loving, learning to learn from positive experiences. Very briefly, these are the eight factors. And you find them in traditional places long before there were any MRIs. So these are not invented by me, but I've pulled to them together and there's evidence for them, okay? So one, the duration of the experience. The longer the neurons are firing together, the more they're gonna to tend to wire together. Stay with it. Second, intensity. The more intensely you're experiencing something you wanna grow inside, the more it will sink in and the more it'll change your, your brain. The more intense the experience, generally, the more change in the brain. Third, I call it multimodality. It just means bringing in as many aspects of your experience as possible. If you're thinking something, try to also feel something. Also, add sensations in your body. Be aware of your desires that relate to that experience. Let's say your, your beneficial values, your aims, your aspirations, your wants. And if you can, bring it into action so you know what it feels like to, you know, to what, what your body do when you're feeling compassionate with somebody, if you're trying to grow that, let's say, okay? Fourth, novelty. The more that we can regard experiences of what we want to grow with beginner's mind, child mind, don't know mind, the more that we can explore different aspects of these experiences, the more that the brain will tend to change because it's a big novelty detector. It's always interested in what's the news, what's the news, what's new, what changed, right? Novelty. Fifth, personal relevance or salience. Why would it matter to me to have an experience of compassion? Or let's say with Armin, why would it matter to me to have an experience of accepting myself in my messy complexity as an immigrant to the United States, which is a wild and wacky culture, uh, right? Right. Right? Now we're into three more that have to do with sensitizing your brain to this very rich experience that you've been you know, activating. Um, intend to receive it into yourself. Don't resist it. Give over to it. Let yourself have it. This will often surface blocks to actually marinating in this beautiful beneficial experience. Like why push it away? Why not let yourself really receive it? Let it change you, give over to it, right? Let it land inside intention, okay? Uh, I think I'm number seven, that's it. N number seven, number seven is to um, <clears throat> help yourself get a sense of it really landing inside. It's coming into your body. It's spreading inside you. It's, your, it's um, sinking in to deeper, younger, more vulnerable places even, okay? And then last, um, track what's rewarding about it. What feels good? What's meaningful or enjoyable in the experience? Um, that tends to increase activity of dopamine and norepinephrine in the hippocampus in your brain, which is the front end of a lot of, of, of kind of social emotional learning. What feels good about it? Now, you don't need to do all eight of those. They're all pretty good. My go-tos again and again are stay with it for a breath or longer, feel it in your body, and notice what feels good about it. That takes about five to 10 seconds. You can do it longer. The more you do it, the longer you do it, the more deeply you do it, the, the, the steeper your growth curve will tend to be. Right. And the deeper, exactly, the, the more motivated we are to do it. Thank yeah. you very much for the neuroscience into it and the Buddhist uh, aspect to it too. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank oh, you. thank you. Really, yeah. thank you. Like, why not get good at getting good? <laughs> why not get good at getting better, right? About getting great. Yeah. And actually, to, to speak to a question, then I'll bounce to you, Rick, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, uh, it's interesting that as we actually cultivate through internalization, growing happiness, growing sense of self-worth, growing skillfulness. We're cultivating capabilities, including interpersonal skills and skills with our own minds. As we do that, craving tends to reduce. Mm -hmm. And we do better for the world. Yeah, because we already feel full. We already feel full and good enough already. 
Okay, so uh, please, thank you. Uh, Monica, please mute yourself because I don't see you on the screen anymore. And then I'm going to ask Rick to unmute himself and then we'll finish up. All right. Hello, my friend Rick, longtime participant in my in-person meditation group, really steadfast. I definitely want to hear from you here. Oh, thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, I've been away for the, from this community for a while, and I really, really missed it. Uh, it's nice to be back, and yeah. it's it's just it's just absolutely wonderful to to listen to your talks and your med meditation. So, so yeah, I thank you. To thank you for that. Uh, and I have been deepening my practice and um, I'm beginning to actually get a sense, you know, for the, the, um, the real benefits of it and, and a Good. sense of calm, calm and, and peace and, and joy, um, particularly in, in, in meditation, but also in my interpersonal relationships. And, and I want to Good. relate just kind of one experience. Now, that, is there a question? Yeah, this room. well, sorry, is there a question? Yeah, question yeah. <laughs> of general value. Yeah, sorry, man, but... um, right. Is there a question? So, well, let me ask you. Yes, sure, there's a question. So, this is really mundane, and I'm going to ask you if, if a mundane experience can also contribute to spiritual growth. Okay. So, and I'm going to relate what that mundane experience is right now, and it has to do with mountain biking. So, I'm, I'm at I'm an awful mountain biker, but I have aspirations to actually become a good mountain biker. And one of the things that I realized about, you know, my lack of skill is that I'm not really pursuing it with a sense of joy. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so I went out the other day and I asked myself, well, I kind of asked myself, why, you know, is there not a sense of, of joy and satisfaction in it? And so that was really my focus is there were two things really improving my skill, but also finding, you know, something really fun about the activity. And, and so here's my question is I was actually able to find that, like I was right. able to sort of find a kind of flow, you know, in the activity. And, and I think, you know, I have to test this is that the next time I go out, the next time I go out, I, I think I'll, you know, enjoy this activity with a great deal more confidence. And so here, here's what my question is, is if, is if like finding joy in something as, you know, mundane as that, can that, can that, um, you know, help to um, like encourage or, or I guess um, like there, there's a certain happiness that I felt. Yeah. You know? And I'm wondering, can that have an effect in the next in my next encounter with like my neighbors or the people I work with? You know, so let me, you know. Well, can so I just partly because we're running out of time, and um, <clears throat> if if I could kind of respond in a way, Rick, to sort that's generalized. Okay, um, my short answer is, you bet. Of course, that can have an effect, and the to me the the deeper response for me is to say how important I think it is to find a way to trust ourselves and trust that which is wholesome within us and to trust wholesome experiences. There you are, you're riding your bike, you're enjoying riding your bike. Can you trust that? Um, can, you, can you trust that the um, happiness, the vitality, you know, uh, the, the sense also of accomplishment uh, and worth, you know, that's there for you. Can you like lighten up on yourself and quit and, and reduce second guessing ourselves? Can we reduce second guessing ourselves and actually trust that, you know, when we sort of let down the mask and drop into palpably beneficial good qualities in ourselves, that that's good enough. And I think that's the short answer to my question is, whoa, that's pretty hard, man. You know, in other words, can you trust yourself? Can you trust what is good within you? Can you trust the goodness you're cultivating? And with less detachment from oneself that is skeptical and doubt, doubtful, you know, doubt is one of the um, five major hindrances um, you know, noted in Buddhism. So that's my, that's my 
And that's my response. That actually really helps. It really helps a lot because it was, I think it was that trust, you know, yeah. sense of trust that was really, that really enabled me to um, like a find some skill, you yeah. know, in this activity. And so I think what I hear you saying is that, yeah, um, you know, look for opportunities to trust yourself in, you know, lots of other ways, maybe as well. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And knowing you for a while, I think, um, yeah, you know, this kind of like trust in the heart, um, trust in your own sweetness, you know, trust in your own intelligence. I say this not just to you, but to us in general. Um, this is really important. And that trust, which has been hard won for me, and I'm going to finish on this sentence, is another aspect of cultivation. So to sum up, if that's okay, um, we've been exploring, you know, a second major myth in Buddhism, Western Buddhism especially, that somehow uh, we should just drop into who, whoever, whatever we are, just be aware, right? There's more to it than that. And the good news is that we really can cultivate good qualities. It's helpful to, um, you know, be clear about the importance of cultivation. And then on the basis of that, know what you're cultivating. That was my second point. Third point, really take in the good of experiences of whatever you're trying to grow and cultivate, right? And then bring what you've cultivated out into the world, all right? And that's a beautiful path with heart. So thank you all. Thank you for sticking around, all 272 of you. And um, I'll see you next week for one more myth busting. And I'll tell you what it is next week. Okay, take good care. Bye-bye.